Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this 10th in a series of webinars delivered by Visit Scotland in conjunction with Business Gateway's Digital Boost Programme and uh, part of a recovery package of webinars aimed at supporting tourism businesses as they look to reopen when feasible. Once again, my name's Andrew Craig, and I'm delighted to welcome Janine Marriott for this second part two in, uh, hello, Jean, uh, Janine. And, um, search engine optimization for tourism businesses. Just a quick reminder again, you're all uh, muted and your webcams are off, microphone webcam off mode, and we'll be distributing a, a link to the PDF version of Janine's presentation at the end of the webinar, as well as asking once again for your feedback via a link that we'll send to you uh, via the, uh, on the screen, we'll put out on the screen later on. If you have any queries about any aspects of search engine optimization, please ask them via the questions tab that you'll see in your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. And remember that this is a 90-minute session and we'll spend 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the, that, those 90 minutes uh, discussing any questions and queries you might have about search engine optimization. And then before I let Janine begin, um, a quick reminder of uh, the offering from Digital Boost, a screenshot of their homepage. Their programme delivers free, a lot of free services, including up to 21 hours of one-to-one -one specialist digital support. Um, that's subject to applications being authorised by a business gateway advisor, of course. Um, they offer workshops and uh, webinars at the moment. Uh, just book the place on their website. Um, that's uh, business bgateway.com slash events and then they also finally offer online guides on 21 digital topics and video tutorials on a further nine digital topics. So I'll now pass things over to Janine Marriott who's uh, here again representing Targeting Innovation and she's going to lead today's session. Janine uh, over to you and I think actually Thanks. I couldn't see my screen prior to that, so I do apologise because I forgot to share my screen. So, Janine, we can all see your screen, so over I'll to you. Thank you. I'll switch my camera off and off we go. Okay. So, last time we, on um, last week, we looked at understanding what your customer is seeing in the search results and why. And we looked at different types of keywords and words that your customers could be using at the different stages of their journey and how to bring that into your content. So today we're going to look at how to use the keywords that we showed you how to research last week and where to put them on your page. And some of the factors as well that we'll look at to see how you can influence how far up the search engines that you go and how to keep up with future algorithms. We're going to have a little bit more in-depth look at local SEO as well and at Google, how you can optimize your Google My Business page and again, small sets, small steps, even that you can take away and implement today to start seeing results in your um, success in your search results. We're also going to have a look at links and why you need them and how to create them. So when you or one of your potential customers enters a keyword into a search engine, Everything that they see at that time, you should consider as pre-click optimization, because that is what they're going to see before they click through to your website. So as a, a business owner who's optimizing their website, you've got two jobs now. Okay, The first one is to encourage people to click through to your site in the first page. And the second one is to use the content that you produce to get them to engage with it once they're actually on your website and hopefully go on and take an action that you want them to do. So either, whether it's to book, whether it's to call you, or whether it's to fill in a form, watch a video, whatever it is. So what you see on the screen now in blue is called your meta title, okay? And it's one of the most important parts of SEO. And it should explain exactly what your page is about using your most important keywords at the front, at, at the, the start of it, and your brand's name at the back. Okay, in the same way that Visit Scotland have done that there. 
depending on the website that your platform is, depending on the platform that your website's built on, it will depend whereabouts in the back end you go to be able to access how you can change this meta title. Okay, WordPress is one of the most popular platforms, and you might be using a plugin for that called Yoast SEO, which is a really easy plugin and help you optimize each one of your pages. Um, but again, depending, everybody will have an area in the back of the website, regardless of what it's built on. So I would recommend you go and have a look for the SEO section, and it's there that you'll find it. Underneath the blue title there is what we call the meta description. And your meta description should be written as a mini advert. Okay, It's the combination of the meta description and the meta title that's going to encourage somebody to click through to your page. It's not a direct ranking factor. Some people think that if you can stuff the meta description full of keywords, that's going to help you get higher up in the search results, which isn't actually the case. But what you can see on the screen there is that some keywords are in bold. Okay, and the keywords that I put into search for this would have contained accessible and Scotland, um, not necessarily holidays, but Google's making the connection between the search terms I put in and showing them to me in bold because it's making it more relevant to my search. Now, although it's not a direct ranking factor, indirectly it is because if you can encourage people to click through to your site and spend time on your site, Google's going to think well, people are finding this page useful and it wants to show useful pages more often in search results. OK, so you write your meta description as a mini advert to encourage people to click through and your meta title is one of the most important parts to tell Google what your page is about as well. Still going along the lines of pre-click optimization, when you're searching for information yourself for your own benefit or if you're trying to spy on what your competitors are doing, quite often you might see results that look like this one on the screen that look a little bit more different to your average title or meta description and they look a little bit more enticing and you probably sit there thinking how do they do that how do they get their results to look like that now nine times out of ten the results that you see that look more attractive to click on are going to be there because they have a code on them and the code is called structured data or you might have heard of it being referred to as schema markup now, putting structured data code on your website is a bit like pouring S um, Red Bull onto your SEO. Okay, It's an advanced SEO technique, and it's not something that we're going to go into discussing on this webinar. But the reason that I'm telling you this is not to try and confuse you. It's just to answer the question that when you see results that look a bit different, and you're wondering why and trying to figure out how your content can look like that, it's because of this code that's on it. Don't go away from here though thinking, I need to find out about structured data, I need to get structured data on my code. You have to keep, you have to do the basics first. You have to still keep creating the content that we referred to. We'll go over on this one, but we also spoke a lot about um, last week because you can't put code onto data or content that isn't there. So if you don't have the content and it's not written in the right way, it's useless to you anyway. Okay, so be aware that this exists and it's for the future but go back and do the basics first. So the second part is of, of your job, your first part to get them on the website, the second part to convince them that they're going to take an action. So this is post-click optimization, and it's everything that the user is going to see once they're on the page, and it's what the search engines are also going to read. Nobody can promise you page one, number one, for any search term, okay? But what you can do and when we talked about how the search engines can try and understand what's on your page. And one of the things that you can do to help that is structure your page properly. Okay, so on this slide, you see the title, Accessible Accommodation in Scotland. And if you think about when you're, when you're writing content on your web page, you probably have the option to highlight it and choose whether it's a paragraph or you might have seen tags um, or headers that are H1, H2, or whatever, and wondered what they are. These are HTML, HTML headers, and they're the main headings that you're going to see on a page. So basically, you want to have your main important keywords as your primary header, 
and then a subheading and then your paragraph. Okay, so there is some structure to your page. You're saying to Google, this is the most important keywords. These are going down in hierarchy. You don't stuff your main keywords into this page. Okay, you're not doing, we're not, keyword stuffing in the past was a lot easier to, to rank a page in Google where you put all your keywords at the top, all of them at the bottom and make sure there was loads of them. And when you, re when you read back the content, it sounded horrendous. You wouldn't speak to somebody like that. So you're going to sprinkle, you're going to write your content, including your keywords, but writing in a natural way. Okay, you did your keyword research, you did your um, semantic words, you, you had questions that people were asking, you can include all of this on the page now. You also need to put your keywords in images, and this is done through what we call alt text. And again, depending on the platform that you use for your website, there will be a place, usually when you're uploading your image, where you're going to have a little box and it's going to ask you for your alt text or your alt tag. They should all be unique. So if you've got five images on each page, each alt tag that you use or alt text should describe what the picture, what you see in the picture. Okay. Now on here, you can see as well an OK alt text would be family on Cairngorms, but a more longer tail keyword. And a, the best way to optimize this would be something like family having a ski lesson on Cairngorms. You want to describe what's in the picture in a succinct um, and descriptive way. You can also put captions on your images to help with accessibility. And you should use your keywords in the file name for your images. Okay, quite often you can upload images and save them as 2747C or whatever it is, .jpg. That's no use for anybody. Okay, make sure that when you actually save your images as well, your file names can be descriptive names too. We spoke previously about page load speed times and one of the things that really will affect your website and how fast it is and something that you can do yourself without having to bring in a developer and spend money is to make sure that your images are compressed okay that, so that they're quick to load and you can use different tools for this you can use photoshop which you, you would need to pay for or there's a free um chrome app called pixlr and um, pixlr i think it is and um, that will do pretty much what you need it to do for um compressing these images there's also lots of tools that are for free on the internet if you google them free image compressing tool something so you can take your images off compress them put them back up and it will speed up your site so now we know where to put your keywords um, in the titles and meta descriptions and how your page should be structured but you need to plan where these keywords are going to go onto your website okay so there's two two stages, your keyword research, which we've already done. Um, and you can also find out keywords that you're already ranking for, which we'll have a look at in the, in the next slide. We've got short tail keywords, we've got long tail keywords, and we know that long tail keywords are more likely to convert than the shorter tail ones. For anybody that didn't go on the previous webinar last week, I would recommend that you go back and, and watch that one first. So this will make a lot, a lot more sense to you. You want to remember not to get caught up in having to rank for every single keyword that you think is a good one. But you, from all the research that you've done, you've got a, a list full of opportunities that you can now start applying to your site. So the way I would recommend that you do this, depending on how confident you are with um, using Excel, is either open up an Excel spreadsheet, get a big piece of paper, a pencil, and definitely a rubber. And, or you can use just post-it pad and a, and a wall, if you like. But what you're going to do is take the structure from your website and map it out so that you can see your home page at the top and all your relevant pages underneath them, however many deep you go. Hopefully, it will only be a maximum of, of two or three deep. You then take your keywords that you've done all your research on and write them underneath the pages so that you're, you're targeting them all together so that you know for this page, this is your group of keywords that you're going to use within your content, whether it's images, whether it's words, whether it's videos, whatever it is, you're planning this out. 
So it's a bit like um, you, you need some structure. We'll look at it another another slide coming up how to do that as well. Before I go on to the next slide, I'm going to be talking about Search Console. So we actually do have a quick poll, Andrew, for, for looking at who actually uses Search Console at the moment, if that's OK. Yep, quick poll for you all, if you could respond. There's a few uh, questions coming up. Um, Janine, we'll see after each, after each question, we'll see the results. So there's the first result, Janine, 52%, uh, almost 50-50. In terms of people who haven't heard of Google Search Console, the following question, do you have your site verified with Search Console? 30% say yes, 55% majority say they don't know, 14 say no. Finally, if you've answered yes, do you use it for how uh, looking at how your site is performing? Once again, it looks like the majority of you saying I, I, I'd like to, but we need help with this. So that really interesting results of that poll there said this is one of the most underutilized bits of kit that you can use from Google that is really going to help you understand how you're performing um, and how your website is performing. So Google Search Console is a free service or a free tool that's offered by Google that is and it's a technical tool, but it's going to help you understand and improve how Google sees your site. So there's lots of things that you can do with this, um, as I say, as a technical tool, and it's easy when you first log into it to get overwhelmed. The sorts of things that you can do is confirm that Google can crawl your site. If there's any indexing problems, it will flag it up to you in this piece of software. You will get alerts through if, if there's any mobile issues and you can troubleshoot things are going on. But for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to talk more about the fact that Google Search Console will help you, will show you the keywords and the search traffic that's actually coming through to your site now. It will show you how often your site appears in Google Search and it will show you which, which queries, some of them that you might be aware of and some of them that you might not be, are actually generating your page to show in in the first place. Okay, so bringing in what we spoke about in session one and about what Google feels is relevant to a particular search query and combining that with your keyword mapping that you've just done or will do um, previously there's a process that I use when I'm looking at sites for search console which is a really good simple process that you can use to help you increase your search engine results but first of all because um, I'll, I'll just tell you quickly how you can verify your site with Google for people that don't know. If you don't use it, you could simply go to put into Google search.google.com or just Google Search Console. And it's literally a case of putting in your URL into the box that comes up and, cl and clicking verify. Okay, there's different ways that you can verify your website on Search Console. The easiest one is if you already have Google Analytics installed, then it can be an automatic verification process. Or there's other simple ways that if you, if you can get into the back end of your website, it will give you a piece of code. And again, depending if you are using, for example, WordPress, there would be a, a place for you to put in the, the tag that um, Search Console gives you to verify it. Okay. And that's there's always going to be issues with some things that you do. Some people have more problems than others, but it should be a simple process to verify your site and then it will start collecting data. OK, so the process that I use in Search Console, you would be able to have a look at the keywords that are showing up. And I, I've got a handout for this, sorry, so don't you don't need to write it down or, or try and keep up with what I'm saying. I've written it down in, in stages for you. So you would be able to look at the keywords that are showing up a lot, but aren't necessarily getting clicked through to your website a lot, or maybe showing at the bottom of page one or page two. When you look at the keywords, you can also have a look and see which page it is on your website that is currently ranking for those search terms. Okay, so the reason that you would be doing that, saying, right, well, I know I've got this page, it's already showing up in search results for X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to optimize that page a little bit more because I want to push it up in search results. OK, 
database, you've identified the keywords and you've identified the page. Now, what you would want to do now is have a look and say, well, what does Google think is relevant? What sort of content does Google think is relevant to those keywords? So you would do, go and do an incognito search and put in the search term that you've already identified and you'd have a look at what your top three results are for that search term because Google wants to show you the most relevant pages for that search term and the relevant types of results. You'll look at the titles, you'll look at the descriptions, you'll click through to the pages and do a bit of competitive research and say, well, Google thinks that I, relevant to that search term is an image, is 500 words worth of content, and it's used these keywords in it. Then I've got another image and I've got all these different words, okay? Then you want to go back and have a look at your own page and see how many words do you have? Do you have images? Have you included the same types of um, intent on your page that the Google's already told you that it likes? Have a look, never copy, be inspired, go back and make some changes. And then you can use Search Console again to give your page back to Google and say, could you please reread this? Now I've read my, now I've made my changes and you will see hopefully um, an increase in search traffic for that page. Okay, so I just quickly say that again, you can identify the keywords and you can identify the page that's showing. You would then go back to Google and have put the keywords into Google and have a look at the type of content it feels is relevant to that search term. Look at the page, pull it to bits, analyze it, see what you're what they're doing and you're not okay go back make the changes to your web page and then use search console to say i've finished i've updated my page can you reread it please and i've had fantastic results using that process it does work I'm not saying it works overnight sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't but it does work and there'll be as i say a handout for you explaining how to do that this is a snapshot of the sort of information you'll see in Search Console. I can't, uh, I won't share real data obviously with you um, for obvious reasons, but just for an example, this one in particular, you would be able to see this is how many times this keyword has shown up in search results. You can then go on, press another couple of buttons and it will show you the number of clicks um, and, and the click through rate and the average position. Now, when we're talking about, we go back to the page titles and the page descriptions, and you know that you need to use your keywords to optimize those, and you know why you're doing that. There's tools that you can use to check your website to see that information at, um, at a glance. And obviously some people are gonna have bigger websites than others, so this will be um, quicker to do. So this is a tool that I use every day. It's a free tool. It is a technical SEO tool, and when you use it, there will be a lot of information for you to see on it, but I'm gonna narrow down the bits that you actually are looking at for the purpose of this. You can, you can have a look up to 500 URLs for free by using SEM, Screaming Frog SEO Spider. If you have got a bigger site than that, then you may or may not want to upgrade to the paid version, which is about 150 pounds for the year it's a brilliant tool for having a look at what you've got on your own site and also having a look at what your competitors have got on their sites too okay you can have a look at page titles and meta descriptions you can find broken links you can have a look and see if it's going to flag up saying these these pages have hardly got any content on them go in and have a look and you can also generate site maps and many many other things for the purpose of this, though, we are looking at finding out meta titles and descriptions. When you download the software, this is what you'll see. Okay, literally, this is what you'll see. And you will just, it's a simply a case of putting in your URL into the box and pressing start. And then depending on how big your website is, depends on how long it will take to, to go in and crawl it, which is very, very, very fast to do. When it's done that, down the right hand side you're going to see a lot of information okay there's a lot of summary information but remember you're using this for page titles and descriptions so you can ignore the rest unless you want to get into it obviously but 
ignore the rest and scroll down to where you'll see a list of all your page titles and all your meta descriptions. When you click on, for example, if you clicked on all, then you would be given a list like this, okay? And literally has every single URL on your website and the title that is currently there. So you can have a look, you can export this information to into an Excel spreadsheet and literally go through each one of your pages and make sure that you're happy with the title that you've already got. Okay, and if you're not happy and you think that you could do better, now you've done all your keyword um, research, then you go into the website and you change your meta title. Okay, you can also, if you have, you know that one of your competitors is always showing above you in search, go in and have a look at what they're doing as well. If they're using it, if they, if you think that's a, really, that's a good meta title, don't ever copy anybody. You've got your own brand voice, you've got your own set of keywords, and you go in and you optimize it in your own way. So just to be inspired. If you've got titles that are missing or titles that are duplicate, because remember you want to have everything unique, then you're going to see that here too. Okay. If tools aren't something that you actually like to use or feel comfortable using, there are manual ways of having a look at pages individually and as a group. This is one of the manual ways that you can do it. And again, you can do it for your own site and you can do it for your competitors as well. When you go onto a web page, you can right hand click and you can click view page source. Okay. When you do that, it is going to bring up all the code that is behind that web page, which again can be a bit overwhelming, but I'll show you how to look for the right information. Depending on whether you are on a um, a MacBook or a PC, I think it'd be Command 4 or Control 4, will bring up the box where you can find information. So you would literally do that, bring up the box, which will appear in the top of your screen, and type in either title or type in um, meta um, description, to type in meta description because those words won't be exactly in the same place. So either title or description, and then you tab through literally tab through until you find what you're looking for but they'll both be pretty much at the top of the page okay if you don't like code and you don't like tools then another quick way to look at either your site or your competitor's site is to use what we call a site colon search so if you put in site and then colon what this is doing is filtering out information, so letting you see only the results from one website that you're looking at there. Okay, this will bring up as well all the all the pages that have been indexed for Google, and you can scroll down and you can have a look at your meta titles and have a look at your meta descriptions, and of and those of your competitors. Okay, now sometimes when you do this, you can get a bit of a shock because Sometimes when websites are built, standard pages are left in or um, meta descriptions have been automatically generated that you might not like. OK, don't get massively hung up on this, OK, especially if they're not your important main pages, because the likelihood of people landing on them in the first place is remote. But it's always good to know what is in the index for your site. OK, concentrate on the most important pages first and you can go in and change other ones as you go along. It will be more of a problem if you've got a big site and you've got a lot of um, titles and meta descriptions that you don't like or are irrelevant to, you know, you don't want that image being put up for you. The reason why that might be a bigger problem is because when Google, we spoke about before, will come in and crawl your pages and read your pages, if it reads one that isn't, an important one isn't relevant or isn't giving good information, it might not necessarily bother going and then reading the more important pages. Okay, basically it'll come in and say, well, that's rubbish content, I can't be bothered to read the others, your time's up, I'm going. So on the larger sites, it's more important than the smaller ones, okay? But just be aware that that, that is there, have a look through. So with all of this information that you've gathered, you know, what do, What are you going to do? You need some structure for it. So you've had your keyword mapping exercise and you have got now, you can create a spreadsheet, you've gone and looked at titles. 
you've looked at titles, you've looked at competitors' titles, you've thought, I wish my title was like that, and you've maybe done that for meta descriptions, the H1 tags, which is the top heading tag, different keywords. Don't just go straight into your website and think, right, I'm updating this, I'm updating that. Put it into a spreadsheet, get some structure, do some preparation. So in the same way that if you were doing some painting and you just were excited about putting in a new colour and you just decided to paint some tiles without doing any prep, and you get halfway through and think, I wish I had, because now the dust is and you're getting lumpy bits. It's exactly the same thing with your website, okay? It is gonna be a much simpler, effective process if you put some structure in and plan it out first. Now, I spoke last week about one of the hardest things to do is actually sit down and create this content, okay? It's gonna be easier for you because you've done your keyword research, you've mapped it out, you've planned it, you know what sort of you know, copy that you want to do. Remember, when you, if, if you're struggling with this, you know your brand better than anybody else. You don't try to be perfect. Don't sit in front of the computer and you know, don't type because you, the words just don't come or you're worried about the grammar or whatever it is. There's a lot of apps that you can use, as I said before, that my, my favorite app moment is one called Otter. And you can just turn it on and start speaking as if you're speaking to a friend. You, If somebody asks about your business, you can speak about it, no problem at all. Ask someone to ask you questions and just speak into them, speak into the app. Then print it off. You can put it to Word, Excel, your um, email, wherever you like, and then you rewrite it. You use your synonyms, you put your headers in, you work out what your titles are going to be, okay? You also recognize you're putting so much effort into this for you optimizing your website. Don't keep it just for your website. You've got social media sites that you can use. You've got directories that you can update. So make sure that you, you share, share it across. We looked quickly at this last week, and this is gold dust for you if you're looking for ideas for content and keywords to, to bump up your content, if you like. Go into TripAdvisor, go into anywhere that anybody can leave reviews for, for you or your competitors and read them and look at the words they're using. And just because you might take for granted what you've got, okay? You wake up to these views every morning, you love that hot tub, whatever. but people that are coming from the city to the country, well, this is what's important to them. You can get absolute brilliant information from reading these reviews. Okay, and think, oh yeah, I wouldn't think to um, describe something like that. Go through and look. Photos as well. We talked about putting keywords into the photos. Some people read, some people watch, some people listen, some people look, whatever it is. If you are writing about views, for example, on your website and you haven't got any images to back that up, nobody's going to convert. Okay, optimize them with alt text and descriptive captions the people need to see themselves in your in your on your tour on looking at the wildlife in your hotel eating your food let them imagine themselves actually there and one of the best ways you can do that obviously is through images appealing to people's emotions in your content is critical when they're making that decision whether or not to come and stay with you or visit you Telling stories, people love to read stories in, in content in story format, and every one of us has a story to tell. You want the person to resonate with you. If someone's looking for family hotels, there's a reason why they like the family atmosphere. Talk to them about your family. Talk to them within reason, obviously, but what have you gone through in your, um, in your changes that you've made for COVID to adjust to their needs? You know, take the pictures, tell them, tell them what you go through to make it even more special for them this time. Okay, everybody's favorite bit or not, link building. You've written all of this brilliant content and we want people now to link to you. Okay, now in a nutshell, if you write good content, people will link to it. Okay, there's two types of links without getting too technical as well that we have do follow links and you've got no follow links now you want to be seen as 
an authority or an expert in your industry. Okay, if you have um, a government website or a really important website that's linking to you, then that could potentially say to Google, this is, I, I value this website, I trust them, I, I give you my, my word that this is okay kind of thing. Okay, and it should inc help increase your ranking in search results. You get no follow links as well, where people can still link to you, but you don't have, it's not passing on any information that's going to encourage your, or increase your, your search results. Both of them are important because they're both sending traffic to your website. Okay, now as Google evolves, and it evolves so quickly, different emphasis is put on the value of links. Okay, and everybody's frightened of getting spammy links or, you know, you can get really hit up on, on the whole link building strategy. It is a really good way of showing authority for your website, but what's arguably equally as important is the relevance of the content on your website. Okay, if people are spending time on your website, you are still showing Google that you are important. You have, if, if you don't, you say don't get caught up on the whole link building strategy. If you haven't got good content on your website, nobody is going to link to it anyway. Okay, so rather than going and thinking I need to implement a link building strategy, it would be much better for you to concentrate on the type of content that you're producing because it will then naturally happen. We spoke last week about different sorts of keywords and we spoke about evergreen keywords, which are keywords that are educational, they're informational, useful, people like to link to that content. And as we spoke about, you want to show that you are the authority in your industry. So when you're writing your blog post and you're writing your, your content and sharing it onto social media, it will naturally happen. Okay. Looking at Google My Business and local SEO, when someone meets you or hears about you for the first time, the first thing that they're going to do is Google you. And if you haven't done it recently, I would recommend that you put your own business name into Google and have a look at the type of results that you get back from it. Okay, everywhere that you show you online, you should be aware of and you should be able to, to get into. It's highly likely that if you have a Google My Business page, then it will be the first thing that you see on the right hand side when you actually put in your business name. So before we go any further, we'll do our second poll, Andrew, if that's okay. The question this time is, are you aware of what a Google My Business page is? Pretty positive responses to that, Janine. That's 87% say yes, 13% say no. Okay. And following on from that, have you claimed and verified your Google My Business page? And once again, pretty positive responses. Most folks saying yes. Perfect. Thank you. So your Google My Business page is your online listing from Google and it's the most important online listing for any local business. It's going to drive local business search results on Google, on search, on Maps, on Google Assistant and many other places. Now there are different policy guidelines for who can have pages and the types of pages that, that you can have. For hotels and self-catering accommodation it can be a little more complicated. We don't have time to go into it in, in as much detail as it maybe needs onto this webinar, but there is a handout for, uh, it's a really useful document, it's called Google for Hotels 101, and getting your business online that I'll include in the, the handouts later on. Okay. Now, this isn't, your Google My Business page is not only essential for new business new customers coming to find you but it's also essential then for repeat customers coming in and finding more information about you it changes all the time okay and what you have available to you in your google my business today you might have another two or three features tomorrow okay so it's worth checking in really freak me to seeing what is there the most popular time popular time the most 
familiar appearance, if you like, of your Google My Business page is, as I said, going to be on the right hand side when somebody Googles your business name. When people are talking about local SEO, they're usually talking about the results that they see underneath the maps in search results. And it's important for increasing the visibility of not only your local customers local to you, but also if somebody was searching for, for example, bed and breakfast in Dundee or a um, golf course in Dundee or whatever, you want your business page to be showing to that person as well. A lot of times people will use near me searches. You might say to yourself, you know, restaurant near me or Google's clever enough to know that if, even if you put in the word restaurant, for example, or trampoline park, whatever it is, because of the device you're using and the words that you're using, it can recognize that as a local result and it will show you maps and listings under maps as a result of that. When you understand how local search is actually working, it's going to be a lot easier to understand why you see the results that you do see. Okay, now it's based on three different features relevance, distance, and prominence. So relevance, how relevant is what your customer has put into the search, is it to the page, to, to the content that you have on your page, okay? How close is your business to the searcher? So close for near me searches and one word searches. If somebody is searching for something in another town, the likelihood of them being shown information close to the center of that town is high, okay? And, but it's also going to take into the, the equation, if you like, the relevance and the prominence too. When we're talking about prominence, we're talking about what other people are saying about your products and services and how well known is your business online by way of directories, are your social media um, profiles got the same name, address and phone number as your Google My Business page? What's the trust? that your business has online in terms of consistency that Google can pick up on. Okay, Google isn't always, it's not just looking at other Google things, it's looking at different directories, it's looking at social media, it's looking at everything. And that's what we need by prominence. You get different sets of results based on where you're looking from and also the devices that you're using. Okay, so for this example, where I'm putting Ghost Tour Edinburgh, I'm seeing directory listings at, above the map. I'm seeing a map, and then I'm starting to see information coming underneath it, which is being pulled from Google My Business pages. Scrolling down underneath the map, things to highlight on here, the information that you see, people can filter by different, different, things that Google will feel relevant at that time. And one of them is rating. Now reviews are so, so, so important. And if somebody can filter on reviews of four stars and up, and you're sitting at 3.9, you haven't even got a chance of being shown in the first place. In okay, case so you want to give yourself every opportunity to be shown when that person's looking for you and the search filters that Google's giving the person. When we speak about relevance, and Google wants to give people the most relevant information that it can, one of the ways it does this, two of the ways, one is by using categories. Okay, so you can see on the screen um, tours and tour operator. These are categories that Google's pulling in. But how it's making it even more relevant is it's seeing here, it's pulling in from reviews. Okay, that says, doesn't see any real ghosts, but the journey was horrifically good. Your content everywhere that Google gives you the, or your customers the ability to put content, you want to use it to the best of your ability with your keywords, your optimization, because it's pulling it in in different places and on different devices and you won't know half of it. So in this instance, it's pulling in from a review. The bottom example is pulling it in from the website. Okay, now you would imagine and, and I would pretty much guess this is the case for this um, this business, that where it says their website mentions ghost tours, then you could go onto their website and see where they're mentioning ghost tours. But sometimes we spoke about meta descriptions recently, a few slides ago. Sometimes Google will ignore your meta description when it shows it in a search result, if it thinks there's more relevant content on the page. 
but I have seen it a few times where Google was pulling information from a meta description and showing it here in these results. So don't ignore anywhere that you've got the ability to optimize, okay? Because it's reading it in different places. It's also um, to point out here the fact that reviews, there's, there's chat all the time. Are reviews a direct ranking factor? Are they not? I would say no, they're not. And this is an example. If they were, then the second result would be at the top, okay? But what they are is a brilliant way to encourage people to click through to your website. Okay, you, if you are a visitor for the first time or someone's coming up to Scotland for the first time and they don't know, remember, they don't know you exist. They're looking for something to do and we hope that it's you. But if they're given three options of places to choose from and one of them's got more reviews than you, they're not going to click on you. The, the likelihood of them clicking on the highest review when it's really high. When you click through to maps, again, different information is pulled through and you can still see that they're, they're pulling through information. Um, it still stands that the reviews are from the website, but you might have the option then to schedule. OK, which is going to show you ticket options available through third party booking providers or reserved with Google. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Sometimes when you see the maps, you will see A, B and C results. Okay, these results don't have any reviews and they don't also have any category associated to them and that's because it's coming from a brand result okay it's just so they understand what you're seeing and why the chances of you ranking in the map pack as well as prominence distance and relevance will be increased if your website can also rank organically for the search term that somebody's putting in okay when you do the same search from a mobile, you can see the same results, but the, but they're enhanced. They've got more images on them. So Google's pulling these images again from your Google My Business page. So really important that you take the advantage of, of um, uploading as many relevant images as you can. So just to reiterate, to increase your chances of being shown in this map pack and in the types of results that you want to be able to see organically and um, underneath the maps and in search, you need to have a Google My Business page verified and optimized to its fullest extent, extent. Sorry. There's lots of different things you can do in your dashboard depending on categories. So I'll just I'll go through these um, quickly. One of them, you've got the opportunity for your optimize your business description, it, it bring in your keywords here, put in a remember that they don't know about you this is an, a chance for them to click through and learn more information about you okay categories are crucial a categories will the categories that you choose will determine what you can and can't do in your google my business page there's over 3000 categories that's a link to them in these slides you want to be as specific as you can we're going to talk a little bit more about po posts on google my business in a second some categories will not let you post okay and self-catering accommodation won't holiday apartment won't but holiday accommodation service will you know there are ways around some issues that you might find with google my business and um, sometimes you need to be creative and sometimes you need to ask for a bit of help going back to the description of your businesses Again, depending on the category that you're in, you may not be, you might not have the opportunity to put um, a description in, which unfortunately will be the case for some of the, the hotel sites. Setting up a short name on Google My Business is basically, it's, it's like a custom URL associated with your Google My Business profile, and it's going to let you share your page a lot easier and encourage reviews to people, okay? So I've put information on the slide where you find your short URL, where you can create it, simply click on info. Google will give you a suggestion of what it thinks you can use. You can choose your own if it's available and you can change it up to three times a year. It's just an easier way of sharing your page. Online reviews, Again, we've, we've spoken about this, how it's a massive, massive factor and how you can get people to, to decide whether or not to click through to your page. 
you need to respond to your reviews too. If you ask somebody for a review and they say yes, what would you like me to say? Sometimes, you know, obviously that could be a little bit awkward. If you can encourage them to include keywords in their review, it's a really useful thing to do. Okay, because Google wants to pull through the relevant information, as you can see from this example here, I put eco-friendly, they've, they've highlighted the word friendly, they've associated the word food with restaurant, which is a clue then that, that we're, we're using the synonyms and Google can make the connection in a more human-like way of the type of keywords and the relevance behind it. Okay, so hopefully that, that's an example for that. When you reply to your reviews, you don't have to, there was talk previously about using keywords when you reply to reviews as well. That doesn't actually do you any favors, okay? I'm all for using keywords when you can use keywords, okay? But you want to answer your customers in a natural way. And I haven't seen evidence of it pulling through um, responses to reviews, okay? The short code that we looked at, creating your short URL and sharing your reviews to people will let them see a picture like this. So people do have to have a Google review, a, a Google account, sorry, to be able to leave you a Google review. So if they're logged in, when you send them the link, whether it is through desktop or, or through the app, then they, you're sending them straight to the page where they can upload a photo, they can give you five stars, they can show the details, etc, etc. You're making it as easy as possible for them to do that. Because not all of your customers are on Google though, you want to make it as easy as possible for everywhere you show up online. If they can leave you a review there, tell them how. Okay, sometimes you might have uh, maybe a postcard on your reception desk or whatever with, with short links to your review sites. Um, plastic, I've seen plastic um, sheets by the till with QR codes and everything to make it easy for people to leave, review, leave you reviews. Google My Business will pull in your social media profiles and it will also bring in reviews from other sites as well. As long as it knows that you're there and the way that it will know you that you're there is by you making sure that the, your name, address and phone number is consistent wherever. You, people can leave your reviews. Okay, that's, that's one way. Another way is to make sure that if you have the chance to verify whatever other platform that you're on, verify your listing, make sure it's verified. Okay. Different industries will have a different number of reviews left for them automatically. And the, the first thing I would say is if you're finding it hard to ask for reviews, then so is your competition but keep going because if, you, if your competition is finding it hard and you're putting in that extra bit of effort, it's well worth it, okay? Industries such as restaurants um, and hospitality, et cetera, et cetera, get more reviews than others. And some of them may be inappropriate. Some of them might not even be applicable to your own business. And there's ways of flagging the review. On the left-hand side, you can see the three dots that you can click on, which will let you flag a review as inappropriate. And if you were doing that from, if I was doing that for, for you and I couldn't get into your dashboard, I was doing it from the front, then the information I would see would be what's wrong with this review, okay, underneath that. And those are the, the five things that I would have to choose from. If you were doing it from inside your dashboard, you'd get a bit more um, information, which is what you see on the right hand side of of the screen there, okay? So a bit more, is it a conflict of in interest? Is it off topic, is it spam? Google are getting better at, at taking down spam reviews. It's really, really hard to get rid of a review unless the person is being derogatory about a member of your staff or one of these um, examples here on the right, okay? Someone leaves you a one-star review and no words about it, it's staying up there. You just unfortunately just can't take it down. Google's response is we expect to see some bad reviews. Everybody expects to see bad reviews and good reviews. You're quite right to take it personally if it's a bad review, but their their take on it is get more good ones. Okay, it's quite frustrating sometimes. You've got attributes in the dashboard for your Google My Business page, and again, depending on the category that you 
put in will depend on the type of attributes that you have. Uh, my advice is to, is to optimize every part in the dashboard. Okay, and I'll show you why in a second. Google is also asking other people's opinions on this. For hotel attributes, they're a lot more in depth than somebody that's, um, I don't know, got a restaurant or whatever. So have a look, look at your categories and make sure that you answer all these questions. COVID wise, it's really important. Um, Google had added an awful lot to Google My Business throughout the pandemic to help you um, communicate with your customers better. So one of them was the health and safety aspects. You've also got the chance in Google My Business to mark your business as temporarily closed and also put any COVID updates. And these show up when people are searching for you. Your customers will be asked to update what they know about your business. So you need to keep an eye on what's being said. So when you Google your business or Google a competitor's business, they will probably be on the right hand side above the questions section. This bit, do you know the, this place? Share the latest information. And they will get, be given a series of questions that they can answer rightly or wrongly. This information will show up in your dashboard. You will get, you will see some orange writing, and it will say this use this page has updated information from Google or from. It doesn't say member of the public. I can't remember the right the the word, but saying it's got updated information that hasn't come from you, and you've got the choice to accept it all or to um to not accept it all. So keep in mind that people are being asked questions and the information might not necessarily be correct. People can also be asked, is this business open? Is it temporarily shut? So you don't want your business showing up as shut when it's not. Again, relevant photographs, businesses with photos will receive uh, average about 42% more requests for directions when we open again. The photography can be the make or break between, depending on the industry that you're in, for somebody making an inquiry. If you have, if you're serving food, or if you're in a place where the, there's, there will be a lot of traffic coming through, especially now, if something is dirty, people, people can be horrible. They want, they want to post pictures that to give you a bad impression sometimes. Okay, and you need to know what's being said and what's being posted about your business. People leave half-eaten food pictures that would put, make someone feel ill and not want to come back. If there's a hair in the food, whatever it is, you can guarantee that somebody somewhere is going to, you know, up these pic, upload these pictures. And again, you can flag them. But you take amazing photography of your premises, of your tours, of your restaurants, whatever tourism business that you're in, people will buy look and inquire looking at pictures and views etc etc so monitor what's going up if in the case you do get a bad picture or, or google's done one of its 360 views and you want to it's not the right one in the same way you can flag reviews you can flag images okay you might, might take about three days five days or whatever it might not come down you can then contact support and ask them to take it down but again, there's a certain amount of um, criteria that needs to match in order for it to disappear. Bear in mind, though, if a photo is taken down and someone feels strongly enough about it, they can put it back up. OK, so just because it's removed once doesn't mean to say that person can't go on and put it up again. So just be careful that you keep an eye on it. You have the opportunity to to create posts in Google My Business. Now, really, depending on your industry and the categories, you can take a lot of what is on your website and put it on your Google My Business page, okay? Um, as I say, hotels, et cetera, don't have the opportunity to, to post, but many of you will. And you can see here, you've got COVID-19 updates. Tell your customers what you're doing. You can have offers on here add events, put your products on. The adding an update post did stay up for seven days, okay? So when somebody first sees your business and scrolls down, they would see a post that was up for seven days. It is, 
it's still in Google's ecosphere, if you like, but unless the customer clicks on see more, they wouldn't see it. That is changing for some businesses. Sometimes it's staying up a lot longer now, just so that you, you're aware of that. If you are a business that doesn't have the ability or um, the structure in place or, or something to say regularly, which is difficult to believe, but if, if some industries are more um, confident about posting than others, you can add an offer or add an event. If you add an event, you've got a start date and an end date. So when someone visits your page, your post that you might usually have been posting weekly might show up there for a month because it starts at the beginning and ends at the end of the month. So there's ways around it. Okay. There's an example of where posts will show. When you when you scroll down to your Google My Business page, this is what posts look like here. You can keep keep them current and they've all got a call to action. Always put a call to action. What do you want the person to do as a result of reading that content? You can put in products as well, which I'll show you in a minute. And products, you can have a product post. And when someone clicks on it, again, you've got more chance to put more information, use it, because Google will pull this information and show it to people in, in different ways. And you've got more calls to action that you can put on. So it might be buy now, order now, call now etc etc Google as I said is pulling information you've seen it through um, reviews you've seen it through um, information being pulled from the website it can also pull information from posts you've put on and the frequently asked questions section so when you are doing your keyword research and you have established different questions that people are asking on Google as well as as a business owner, people, your customers ask you questions all the time. They're not the only person that's wondering that. Okay, so it's worthwhile pre-populating the questions and answers section, a to help your business, your potential customers, but b to help the search engines find out more about you. Okay, you have to do this from the front of the, of Google. You, it's, you don't get to it from the dashboard. So you can click on ask a question. You ask the question as yourself and then you can just go in and answer it okay so use that again um, to the best of your advantage sometimes keep an eye on the questions and answers section on your page some people will leave reviews there and um, you will get local guides that come in and, and offer help in there as well some of it's correct some of it's not and you can also flag these questions so it might not be applicable to the pay, to the place if it was a bad review, you can flag it and say it's not it's not a question. And that quite often gets taken down from there. So just keep an eye on, on what's there. I should say, sorry, that this the frequently asked question feature isn't available on some pages at the moment. It used to be available on all of them. I don't know if Google's doing a, a test to see if it's going to take it away. So if you don't have it, it's not a case that you can swap category and it's going to appear if it might be that for your industry it's been taken off just now but if you do have it then then use it some businesses will have been given a products tab in the dashboard okay and you can bring as much from your website in in this way as possible for restaurants bring in your food bring in your menu items for gifts bring in your gifts you know use this as well to showcase everything that you have on your website because when people put in your name the google my business page is going to show and they can they can call you they can go to your website whatever they might not need to do anything they might just see what they want on your google my business page your what you see in desktop on google my business as well is going to be different to what you see on mobile okay so have a look in as many places on different devices as you can to make yourself familiar with what shows up and where if you don't sell products but you sell services then be creative and bring in your services as products okay reserve with google Goo, Reserve with Google is a service available to you via Google My Business. It's not a booking software, it's a technology that combines your Google My Business profile with your booking software. 
So making it a lot easier for your clients then to go through and buy tickets, add it to their diary, find you through maps, et cetera, et cetera. You still, you need to sign up with a booking software provider and you can get a list up, put uh, a link to them in the document that Andrew will give at the end. If you're not sure about the best booking provider to team up with, you can either look at, do your own research obviously, look at who your competitors are using, but when you click on the booking section in the dashboard, depending again on your categories, and if you've put in additional categories, you will get a small or a larger range of um, providers there to choose. Okay. Your business has to be verified before you can add the booking button. So I know that the majority of people have their pages um, verified already. But if you don't, or you need a hand with it, then you need to make sure the reason why you don't have a booking button is because your page isn't verified. Once you have signed up, when you click your booking buttons, you'll see that customers can now book you on Google through whichever provider that you're with. So you can be, if you were a restaurant and you were on Just Eats, Deliveroo, um, I can't remember the, the, the other one, main one, but Uber Eats. You can be on all of them and you can choose which one you want to show as, as a priority. If, if people can order through you as well as a service directly through your website, you've now got the ability to add that as well. And you can prioritize that booking rather than the others if obviously if the fees are, are going to be less for you. Okay. So you can have a look, look at your bookings button um, and see what Google's presenting you with. If you, if you have something appearing on your Google My Business page that you don't want to be there, you don't want a particular booking provider to show up on there, you can't take that off yourself. Okay, you have to contact that booking provider and ask them to take you off. When you first sign up as well, so say you are you know, opening a new restaurant, when you first sign up, it doesn't automatically come through straight away. There'll be a, a few days worth of delay and then the link will show through on your page. Okay. When I said earlier for you to Google your own business, as in put into Google your business name, not, not meaning to do with Google My Business, so that you can see where you appear. You want to make sure that you can, everywhere that you show up, in every directory, any listing of your business, you know what's being said about you. People will leave you reviews in places that you might not even know they've done so, unless you can log in and that you've got, um, um, I can't think of the word, you, you know, you can get in, you've got control of what's being said about you online. Okay, so what I would suggest you do is create a spreadsheet, Google your name and list every directory that you show in, and do that as well for your competitors. So if your competitor is in 80 directories and you're in three, then you know that's one of the things that you need to do to try and compete with them because they're, if they've optimized those listings and their name, address and phone number is consistent, then they will have like a bigger trust and uh, um, authority with Google than you do. Okay, so nobody, again, nobody can promise you page one, number one for certain search terms, but what you can do is make sure that you're doing everything that you can, that Google's looking for, to give yourself a higher chance of showing up in those search results. Okay, so you want to build trust in the local kind of Google sphere. This going in and claiming each directory can be really time consuming um, and you can lose hours of your life doing it but it's well worth doing it. Every bit of content that you have now um, created with your keywords for your website, you've now got a chance to put it in different places in these different directories where it allows you to, okay? And you know that you're going to be using keywords, you know why you're using them, always looking at the intent behind the keyword, okay? You can use tools, if you don't want to do this yourself, the tool that I use is called Bright Local. Okay, you do have to pay for it monthly, but you can pay them something like um, between 60 or $70, I think, for them to go through and 
put you in the top directories for that industry that you're in. It's not going to go through and optimize each directory for you. It will literally clean it up if you like. You can turn it, I want to use this name, this business description, and this phone number. And they'll go through and do it. And then you have to then log in and go through and optimize each page. It's a quicker way of doing it. It takes about three weeks, I think, or you can go through and do it manually. Google My Business is where I know the majority of people last week actually did have a website. But for those that don't, Google My Business gives you the, the ability to create a free mobile first website. It will pull through the information from your Google My Business page by way of posts that you put up. So you're always going to get fresh content. You can put in your scheduling, your booking software as well. And it will give you a very basic website for people to be able to find out directions to you and to get in contact with you. It's not a um, it's not a substitute for having like a big website with all your content on it, but it's definitely a good placeholder while you're getting a website delivered, delivered, made, or um, one to, it, it's depending what you want to use it for. You know, if you just want to have a presence, then it's ideal for a smaller base business as well. You can have .com domains as well. You can buy through Google um, and you can point your domain that you have already to this website if the one that you don't, if your website you have at the moment you don't like, it's not mobile friendly or it's work in progress, um, then you can point the domain to one that's free through Google. Insights with Google My Business are quite basic and they're being updated all the time. They're going through a bit of an update at the moment. It's not, it's not the best, but um, it will let you see keywords to a point where your page is being generated. But what it is good for is letting you see the actions that people are taking once they go to your website, go to your Google My Business page. So you can see on this one, it's one and a half thousand requests for directions over the last month. You can choose one month, two months, or three months. Um, and if you switch on the messaging feature as well, then it will let you see how many people have messaged you. The app for Google My Business, I would recommend that you download it to make your life easier as all apps do. There's things that you can do on the app that you can't do on the dashboard on the dashboard on a desktop and vice versa. Up until recently, this was the only way downloading the app that you could switch on a messaging feature for Google My Business. So businesses that are looking for your maps, if you had it switched on, would be able to send you a message to ask maybe if they get lost or they've got general questions. It's not something that is used in across many different industries. Some use it all the time. The customers use it all the time. Some don't use it at all. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it's not the easiest to find on Maps anyway, the messaging feature. But Google's put it there for a reason. Um, and it's another way for, for customers to contact you as long as you are then able to answer those messages when they come through. If you're a busy restaurant or busy hotel, it might be the last thing that you want to have somewhere else to, to try and monitor for customer activity. But so just know it's there and then um, decide whether it's the right thing for you to do. You can now switch it on from the dashboard. So on the left hand side, you will have a messaging feature. I don't know yet whether it brings in um, a history of messages. It's only a recent thing they switched it on in, in the dashboard, so we're waiting to see. Another thing that you can do with the app is you can create a welcome offer. So people have the option to follow you on Google My Business. Okay, so Google My Business isn't a social media tool, but Google puts these things here for a reason. Um, if they follow you, they're going to get updates that you, as you post. Or if you update your hours or if, if you've, you've changed bits and pieces and they'll get notifications to their phone. You can change your welcome offer. Um, when, when people follow you, sorry, they get a welcome offer. You can change the welcome offer as often as you want to. And it can be valid for two weeks after somebody starts following you. So you could encourage people to follow you from your other social media channels. 
So, so we're now live on Google My Business, stay up to date for recent changes. And here's the link because you've created the short link for them. Google has got a free marketing kit that you can go to and on there you can download templates for review us on Google. You've got um, posters where it will bring in some of your five star reviews. You can make postcards that you can send out to people or have them on your desk. And it's, it, it's really good for ideas, Google's free marketing kit. There's a link to it in the, um, the link that Andrew will give you. But what I don't like about it is that it doesn't let you, it doesn't do your brand colors. Okay, so what I would recommend that you do is take ideas from here and ordering reviewers on Google stickers, then absolutely you download the template and send it to a printer for that. But take ideas from here and I would then recreate them on something like um, Canva so that you have them in your own brand colors and you can use your reviews as posts as well, okay, to encourage more. Sometimes people will leave you a review on Facebook or TripAdvisor or whatever. You can take that and use it as a post rather that you can't add it as a you can't go into google and as it as, add it as a review yourself okay but there's different ways that you can um use it to your advantage keeping on top of the algorithms and avoiding penalties there's a lot daily that changes in the seo world and it can be completely overwhelming for even you know, people that do it as their jobs and that, that love to learn, sometimes you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it's, that's changed or that's changed and trying to learn it all um, is near impossible. So you will get a lot of information from Google search forums. Okay, there's links in the slides to those. You have got Google support that you can go to and ask questions. Obviously, you can follow um, Google on social media if that's something that you wanted to do. But following reputable SEO companies is a really good idea. And these are some of my favorites here that I've put up there for you. Um, and go in, they're easy, they're, they're like bite-sized chunks of information that, that, that makes sense. They put it in normal language and it's not too technical. And then you can, if you want to get more technical, obviously you can dive a lot deeper, but it does help to keep up with what's going on. So just before we come to the summary, to recap on what's going on in this on this webinar, there's, there's obviously there's a lot to take in on the two webinars together, but your priority has got to be your content. Okay, there's a lot of things that you can do after you've added your content by looking at your link strategy, looking at different codes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But without your content, it's worthless. There's no point doing it. So spend time researching your keywords from the previous webinar and then structuring where you're going to put them so that you know this page is we're talking about these keywords you've looked at search console and used that as a tool to see the keywords that you're already ranking for and work more on that okay your keywords the intent behind those keywords which will help you generate your content and then you know preferably at the same time work on claiming, verifying and optimizing your Google My Business page. Again, bringing in the keywords and filling in the information at every opportunity that Google's going to give you for that. To go over them again, your, your keywords and your H1s, meta descriptions and titles, to your search console, read your reviews for your business and your competitors to see what they value and include them in your content and use the tools either the, the paid tools, the free tools, or, or doing it manually to help you see what you and your competitors are already doing, okay, not, not to get overwhelmed. So that's me finished, Andrew, thank you. I'll let you pass back over to you. Superb stuff, Janine, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, a few questions, so there's some links on the screen that you should be able to see now. Plus, to some useful resources, as Janine mentioned, we'll um, distribute these slides um, I'll distribute them by email. It'll probably the email will come out tomorrow, and um, there will also be all the resources that Jean's mentioned today, including the resources that you see on screen just now, and including details of our <coughs> um, latest 
um, a responsible tourism campaign will all be found in the, uh, in the um, slides that we and email that we distribute tomorrow. You can also download um, the uh, a simple handout on these two previous slides on responsible tourism and visit Scotland's uh, useful links. There's a handout section in the control panel of GoToWebinar. The, that, the handouts don't always work, depends on the devices that you're using, but don't worry, if you can't download it just now, we'll um, send it out by email tomorrow. Uh, Janine, thank you again for, for your time today, and I've got a couple of questions before we wrap things up, if that's okay. Of course. Brilliant. So, firstly, um, you mentioned uh, meta title structure. Uh, keywords first, then brand name. Someone has asked the question saying, well, mine is the other way around. Should I ask the developer? And that was generated by a Yoast uh, plugin. Should I ask the web developer to change this, or does the plugin choose that structure for a reason? The also when you put Yoast plugin in, it automatically, depending on the on the way it's set up, will bring in or can bring in your brand and then the title of the page or whatever, you can override that on each page. You can go in and at the bottom of each page, you can override that and put in your own meta title. I don't know the way it's been set up for and who determines that that reason for doing it, but your most important keywords would, should come at the front and your brand at the back. Mm. So reading it, reading it from that way in. So you can manually go in and change it if you're if you're um if your developer's doing it you want you want to know what's being changed and why it's being changed i wouldn't ask anybody just to go in and change it you you have control over that and you want to change yeah. to a and also see for, for yoast where it's red yellow and green it, it's okay to be yellow as long as you know why you're yellow that so they've got a structure for for yoast to say this is good seo this is okay and this is bad but it's okay it's okay to be yellow as long as you know why okay i, I suppose a key message here as well is maintain a, a very um, decent level of communication with your web developer don't just sit in the dark and but don't be afraid to ask questions and ask why they're doing certain things and, and if they are yeah. making changes to aspects of your website ensure that there's that you know, there's constant communication when this is happening test once they've done made these changes as well test thoroughly what they've done make sure go through it from a consumer uh, a consumers or customers perspective check what they've done on your website to see if it's working as, as you would want it to work yeah and uh, I'm sorry, as well so, so if you're not happy if, if you ask a question and you don't understand the answer or it doesn't quite make sense keep asking the question until it does make sense because otherwise it's yeah. just going to sit with you and not be happy yeah, a question I think a lot of people will want to hear about, Janine, because it probably affects quite a number of folk on, on this webinar today. Um, someone's mentioned that they are quite low down, in fact, on page six or seven of the map pack, Google's map pack, and sometimes don't show up at all. Um, they've done many of the things, in fact, probably all of the things that you've suggested. Are there any other problems that might stop them ranks, any businesses in this, this kind of category? sort of them from ranking higher? There's the main ones to have a look at is, I mean, if you've done everything, it's one thing doing everything and it's an, another thing, not to say redoing it, but double checking the categories. What categories are your competitors in? Without without knowing the actual, looking deeply at it, I wouldn't be able to, to, to spot something kind of thing. But if you do the basics, um, which obviously this person is saying they've done. Then to remember that Google's working on prominence and relevance and distance to make sure that you're in all of the categories, it, all in the directories is a good thing to do. To look at the categories and see if you've got one main category and you've got a few additional categories. It might be those additional categories are either haven't been used and they're not relevant, or you could go and put more additional categories in. Um, so there's lots, there's there's a lot that goes into it other than getting the basics right. So you, I, I would want to have a look at it further, and and I'm happy to do that if the person wants to share those details, and I'll have a quick look and see if I can spot something. Okay, that's it. Um, 
Somebody else has asked a question around um, uh, having a long company name, and that means that they've got a, a different Twitter handle to their company name and then other social media. What would you be able to suggest there in terms of uh, having something that's a long company name, being able to change maybe? In terms of it going on the meta title? Or... Yeah, I think so. I think that's what they mean. So there's different ways that your brand can get out there. So but putting your brand name at the end of the meta title is, is for obvious reasons, so they know more clearly who it's for. But I would still say your keywords are still most important. So if you've got the choice between putting keywords or putting your brand name, then I would be choosing keywords. When it comes to the short um, the short code, ideally you would have the same short code on your Google My Business as, as some of your um, handles. It's not always going to be possible to do that, so I, I, you just want to find the most relevant one to you. I don't know if you can abbreviate your company name or mm. you know, but you want to have keywords are more important than that. If you need brand awareness or want to do brand awareness, then you can you can advertise, you can you can advertise, display advertising for brand awareness, but for SEO, and it depends on the situation, to be honest. The keywords over brand name, I would say. Okay, and then one, I think we've got time for one final question. Um, something said, um, clearly Google My Business is important, but on a scale of one to ten, how important is it within the whole scope of SEO? Bit of a fun question for the end here. Yeah. So you've got, I don't know, if, if people watch the webinar beforehand and there's different sorts of SEO, local SEO is done in a slightly different way to just optimizing content for your website. So depending on what sort of business you are, whether you whether people are searching more for your business near them or, or, or can travel to your business, then I would say <laughs> you want to do both, really. But Google My Business, it's, it's a free tool from Google and it's so powerful and it's so important. So don't don't ignore it. It's not going to take you very long to optimize that page. So, but, so go in and optimize everything the best that you can and then create content and yeah. uh, and work on both of them. But if you want, if you've got the option to have both, have both. So on a scale of one to ten, um, I would say. I would be biased and say 10 for Google My Business because that's my yeah. my thing. Uh, and it's um, different sorts of results. Do both. Put both at 10. There you go. It would, it would be similarly high for me. Yeah. And download, as you mentioned, Janine, download, uh, download the Google My Business app. Incredibly useful. Yeah. And be aware of, look yourself what, what appears on, on mobile compared to what you see on desktop because you'll only see services on a mobile you won't see it on a desktop so if, for example that's that's one thing just know what what's showing and where that's really important brilliant janine thank you again for your time if you have any further queries you can email industry.development at visitscotland.com